We thought we'd crunch some numbers for you tonight. ESCOM is facing a black hole in more senses than one to discuss. So we're joined by Chris Yelland from EE Publishers. Great to have you with us, Thank Chris. You. Okay, let's start with ESCOM's first complaint now, and we're going to bring up a graph. They say that what they're getting for electricity is not cost reflective. They, they need to charge us more. So, so this is from their interim results uh, last year. Income per kilowatt, 74 cents. Uh, that's what it costs them to make a kilowatt so they're actually making a little profit on on each little kilowatt um, but they say it's it's not enough basically that's right um, they say it's not enough it's not cost reflective uh, but at the end of the day uh, you know one has to look at the affordability of electricity and one has to look at what one's using one's uh, profits for um, you know you cannot fund a capital expansion of the size of Madupi and Kassili off the normal operating profit of the business. Mm. You may need to take out loan finance. You, know, you may need equity finance. At the moment, what they seem to be wanting to do is to fund the entire ESCOM and its new capital development program through the tariff. And unfortunately, there's a limit to what you can charge on the tariff before electricity becomes unaffordable, number one, for the average person in the street, and number two, uh, for industry. Mm. Uh, and at a certain level, it makes South African industry uncompetitive. And, 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 and South African industry cannot cope with a price shock. Uh, and, 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 and that's why uh, you have to look at other sources of funding uh, like loan finance and like uh, equity. I, I'm going to get to that, the, the solutions mm. that, that you've put forward. Let's just look a bit more at the numbers. So, that, so they're making a little bit of a profit, but mm. it doesn't fund this huge expansion uh, like you're saying. And if we move to, to what the book said last mm. year, they, they also made a little bit of a profit overall. Um, you, you take their revenue, operating costs, uh, you take off the, the coal and diesel costs. We'll talk about those because they're important. Um, you take of other costs, they've still got a little profit at the end, but they're basically saying that will be wiped out by the end of the financial year in, in March. Why is that being eroded mm. constantly? Well, it's traditional uh, in Eskom that they uh, make their profits in the first half of the year. Uh, and in the second half of the year, uh, they make reduced profit. However, in this financial year, they're actually predicting that not only will they make a reduced profit in the second half of the year, they're going to make a 9 billion rand loss in the second half of the year, which is going to wipe out that 9 billion rand profit in the first half. Now, we have to look really at what are the reasons for this. Uh, and, and there are a few reasons that I can uh, highlight. Uh, the first is uh, this uh, very increasing use of diesel. Now, in the last financial year, they budgeted to use 3 billion rand of diesel. They actually used 10 billion rand. Question is how so much diesel, diesel costs are out of control. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But they, these and they're using these inefficient turbines more and more, more. Is that the, the root cause of well, this? Well, they certainly are diesel guzzling turbines, and that is the root cause of it. Uh, so uh, really what one is seeing, we don't know what the cost of diesel is going to be this financial year. We know that the price of oil has dropped, uh, but at the same time, Eskom are using these open cycle gas turbines, which run on diesel, are using them much harder than previously. So uh, ultimately, I'm expecting uh, you know, that probably the diesel uh, uh, usage is going to be about the same this year. So we're going to see a, another figure of about 10 billion and, and rand of diesel. And the price of oil plunging, does that help? Well, it does help, uh, but if you use more, uh, diesel because you're pushing things harder because uh, the generation fleet is declining and you're having to rely on your open cycle gas turbines more and more is pushing up the cost per unit even though the price of diesel is dropping. Let's pick out uh, uh, something else mm. here. Uh, if you look at the other costs, that includes costs to pay off debt. And like you say, uh, ESCOM is being given this responsibility mm. of, of borrowing money to fund this huge infrastructure program. So no mm. doubt those will go up as well. Correct. Uh, as Madupi and Kusili's construction progresses, uh, the ESCOM debt is increasing. Uh, and the interest on that debt is therefore increasing as well. But I think even the, you know, another factor we're looking at these figures 
is the sales revenue. The sales revenue for the first six months is 82 billion rand. In the second six months of the year, uh, sales revenue drops. And the reason for that is that Eskom's bulk electricity supply to municipalities, to large industry, is seasonal in, in price. In other words, the winter price is much higher than the summer price. Therefore, the revenue in winter, the first six months of the year, uh, is much higher than the revenue in the second six months. So what we're seeing is a trend L of let's declining just sales and increasing costs. It, let's just explain for viewers very quickly mm. that we're actually in the second half of the year, That's even right. though uh, 2015 mm -hmm. has started. We're, we're talking about the financial mm. year yes. for, for ESCOM. A great explanation of this. If, if we move to the next slide, Chris, mm -hmm. I want to look at cash flow, yeah. um, w which is basically what ESCOM is saying is their main problem right now. And, and why is this happening because yeah. we are making a little bit of a profit um, yeah. on each kilowatt on on the books overall but I guess what what the problem here is is that they're booking revenue but that doesn't mean the, the money's coming in mm. that's right uh, because when you bill a company or you bill a customer uh, you, you know that's part of your debtors and you only get paid perhaps one month two months three months later and sometimes never in which case uh, you have to write off that debt and then it affects the income statement. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, in the second half of the year, Eskim, which is now by the way, in other words uh, uh, up until uh, the 30th of, of March, mm. in the second half of the year sales is down, so incoming cash is down, uh, costs are up because of massive use of diesel, uh, as you say interest is, is up as well, and by the way coal costs are also ever rising. Uh, and, and Eskom is in a situation now of a severe cash flow crisis uh, as a result of this declining sales, increasing costs, uh, you know, debtors, all of these things that you've talked about, to the extent where the auditors of Eskom are really seriously questioning whether Eskom is a going concern. Mm -hmm. And a lot of effort has been spent uh, you know, on, on this very subject. To the extent where, for example, the Minister of Finance has recently indicated that the 60 billion rand quasi-equity subordinated loan, which is reflected in the balance sheet as a loan, is now being converted to equity. So uh, that's a loan uh, from government, but now it's being converted to, to ownership by government. Th th essentially, it was a loan by government to Eskom, which Eskom would have to repay plus interest. Mm. Once it's converted to equity, of course, that money was already given to Eskom several years ago, uh, but now that money doesn't have to be repaid and there's no interest on it. Uh, so it, it's really a kind of, uh, you can say, creative accounting after the event to try and strengthen the balance sheet by converting quasi-equity into equity. Uh, but it doesn't change the cash flow position at all uh, because the cash has already been given to Eskom as part of this loan several years ago. So it's a kind of creative accounting to try and strengthen the balance sheet. Okay, so I looked at the, the mm. six months uh, that, that we've got on the books until the end of September last year, and the cash flow was actually negative. Correct. Um, but luckily, ESCOM had some money in the bank at the, at the start of that mm. period, and it had about 12 billion left mm. in September. So it sounds like that 12 billion is gone. ESCOM says it needs cash just to buy diesel. Um, and, and why are you so worried about that, that request for another 20 billion? Well, you know, last year, the Minister of Finance indicated that, the, that it would provide a further 20 billion rand of equity to Eskom. That is, uh, it's, it's a payment by the shareholder of cash uh, to, 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 to its operating company. Now, it must be deeply disturbing for, for Minister Nene to now hear that this equity, which should be financing long-term assets, remember long-term finance should be used to finance long-term assets. And now Eskom are proposing to use this equity to pay for operating expenses, to pay for diesel. This is like using your credit card, on your, your, your budget account on your credit card to pay for tonight's supper. You know, it's a sign it's that there's nothing the left costs. in the current account and you're putting this, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're turning this into debt. Uh, and, and really this is a very bad signal and if I was the Minister of Finance and, and I would be very disturbed and I think the Minister is disturbed. Chris, let's, let's end it here then. Looking at this, 
it seems like ESCOM is in an impossible situation. There's a historic backlog. There's a huge mm. need for new power plants. It doesn't have the money coming in to, to pay for that. So is there an argument now to, to let ESCOM run by itself, but, but remove that, um, that burden of, of creating this new infrastructure? And, and surely government has to step in or somebody has to step in. Well, at the moment, Eskim is not a going concern. And it's up to the shareholder to recapitalize its business. The problem is, of course, that the government, the shareholder, doesn't have the money. Now, you may think that that's an impossible situation, but it's actually not impossible at all. There's a very easy solution, and that one, uh, one that has been done many times before. One needs to restructure. One perhaps needs to unbundle. One perhaps needs to list on, a, on the stock exchange, and one perhaps needs to take on strategic equity partners. It's no good throwing money at the problem and just thinking that that is, where, uh, that is the answer. Just throwing 20 billion or 30 billion or 50 billion is not the solution. Is this privatization, a garage sale? Not of, necessarily, of no, not necessarily. It, it may be considered a partial privatization, but let's just look at a, a particular example, and that is ISCO. The old ISCO today, is Kumba, which handles the iron ore side of the business, Exaro, which handles the coal side of the business, and ArcelorMittal, which handles the steel side of the business. These are now three unbundled companies listed on the stock exchange, attracting new sources of finance, of technology, of know-how and management skills. And, and these companies have actually made the sum of these three are now bigger than the original S e score. And, and much government bigger. could still hold a, a significant stake. I, I want to uh, be the devil's advocate mm. because uh, there, there's not a commercial incentive to take electricity to deep rural areas where you have so few customers. But but that's a, a priority for, for us as a nation. And, and we know Enron in, in the States. Uh, that was a private company manipulating, uh, even switching people off. So so they would pay more for electricity. So, so what about the dangers mm. of taking something as, as crucial as, as power and giving it to uh, private entities? Well, as I say, I'm not suggesting that sh this should be a privatization. A government can retain a very significant, even a controlling shareholding uh, in the business. Take, for example, Telcom. Uh, uh, Telcom has been uh, listed on the stock exchange. Uh, it attracts uh, capital, it attracts know-how. The new management at, uh, at Telcom uh, seem to be doing really good things uh, at Telcom. Take a look at Sassel. It used to be a state-owned enterprise. Today, it's a global, multinational uh, chemical enterprise uh, on the world stage. Uh, so this is what uh, unbundling and uh, attracting uh, foreign capital and local capital skills and management can do to a company. And I think Eskom is operating as it used to operate 70 years ago. It's the only company in its class that still operates in this way. It needs to really take a hard look about how to become responsive in the modern age. Well, thank you for explaining all of this and, and making it understandable. That was Chris Yelland from EE Publishers. So after a rough start to the week, the JSC bounced back today, supported by a rally in mining stocks. Investors were cheering better than expected data out of China, which is of course a major buyer of commodities. Here's a look at your main financials.